The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, my name is Derek North, and I'm an enrolled uh, agent and premier account executive here at Federal Direct Tax Services. And today, what we're going to be going over are tax prepare ethics and Circular 230. It's going to cover who can practice before the IRS, uh, the RTRP uh, and EA requirements, uh, continuing education details, uh, renewal details for your various certificates and uh, authorizations, and due diligence when it comes to actually preparing tax returns. Okay, what is Circular 230? The Circular 230 is the common name for what's called the Treasury Department Circular Number 230 uh, Regulation Governing Practice Before the Internal Revenue Service. This document, what it does is it defines the registration requirements for various classes of tax professionals and a few other financial professionals that we're not really going to cover too much in this particular webinar. The rules, the penalties, and the continuing education requirements for pretty much all of the professional designations that are licensed to practice before the IRS or subject to what the IRS calls the Office of Professional Responsibility, which you'll probably hear me call the OPR a couple of times while we're doing the presentation. It forms the basis for most ethical considerations regarding tax practice. So almost anything and everything that you can get in trouble for, the rules and all of this other stuff, it's all covered inside Circular 230. It lets you know who's responsible, uh, who's subject to various penalties, and what your requirements are as a preparer. One of the first things that Circular 230 does is it outlines who can practice before the IRS. There are only a handful of individuals that are actually capable of practice before the IRS, and they are the following. Enrolled agent, uh, that one right there is the one that's strictly, specifically federally tax-related, and it's also the one that most of the people here in the office happen to have as a professional designation. And uh, Circular 230 also allows for people to practice before the IRS who are certified public accountants, enrolled retirement plan advisors, enrolled actuaries, and of course, attorneys licensed to practice within their particular state. The IRS is empowered through what's called 31 United States Code Section 330 to regulate those people who can practice before the IRS by determining their character, their reputation, their qualifications, and their general professional competency. Uh, some of you guys, especially ones that have been with us for a while and have gotten uh, gotten an EFIN, uh, understand that during the process of applying for an EFIN, they do a background check. Uh, this 31 USC section 330 right there is what gives them the power to make sure that you don't have anything on your record that's going to uh, prohibit you from operating ethically. The IRS is also empowered to suspend or disbar persons from PAT practice or for being incompetent, disreputable, unqualified, or deliberately fraudulent or criminal in nature. Uh, almost every single tax season, uh, when it's finished, the IRS starts their prosecutions, and that's when you're going to see uh, you know, the, the places across the United States where somebody was trying to do something illegal and ended up getting caught uh, and sentenced to a pretty hefty amount of time in prison. And uh, this, is, this entire section right here is governed by Circular 230 and that U.S. code that we were talking about. Freedom of Information Act. The Freedom of Information Act in itself is not something that's specifically tax related. However, it is useful uh, in this context because the Freedom of Information Act allows public requests for non-classified information from government bodies in the interest of transparency. So we got a little thing here that says, has your phone been ringing? Have you received unsolicited emails? Uh, anybody who has... Um, RTRP designation, which is now defunct, but the lists did exist when the RPR or RTRP designation was relevant, enrolled agents, continuing education providers, individuals and firms who have been disbarred, suspended, censured, levied monetary penalties, people who have P-10s, all of this stuff is available from the government through Freedom of Information Acts, and the longer that you participate in tax preparation as a business, the more emails and the more random calls that you're going to get from tax software providers, from CE providers, from people who make tax books and little guides and accounting firms, things of that nature. And if you are wondering, you know, how did they get my information, it's because of this. There's only a certain amount of your information that you're going to be getting uh, out there, but it's definitely enough to be able to contact you in particular through email. Spam. Like I said, 
you are going to be receiving emails, postcards, phone calls, letters, booklets, software, all this stuff. Uh, I know I personally get it uh, here at my work address, I get it at my home address, I get it in my email. Uh, this happens at least once a day. It's nothing to be worried about. Uh, in a long enough time, you'll be able to isolate which ones you don't want to have anything to do with and, and probably hide them from your, from your inbox. But just be aware that if you do have a P10 or you do get a professional designation, that you are going to be subject to these things. And there are a lot of options. A lot of options out there for your, for your continuing education requirements, for your testing materials. I know that we uh, have a lot of that available at a discount for our partners. But if you're curious for shopping around, look for the IRS CE provider logo. Uh, you can see that actually located right down at the bottom right of the slide down there. It looks like that. Uh, you, know, you can do your homework and find out what a good price is, you know, what's within your particular range. Registered tax return preparers. Uh, anybody who's been doing taxes for more than a couple years is aware of the registered tax return preparer initiative that the IRS uh, attempted to start off a few years ago. What they were were a category of tax preparers that were defined through revisions to the federal statutes with an ability for limited practice, like a, an EIA, like a diet EIA or EIA or EA light. You know, they were the final push from the IRS to institute nationwide tax regulation of the, prepare, of the preparation industry because of the problems that seem to be you know, coming from not having it licensed, the disreputable preparers, the, the fraud schemes, and they were trying really hard to get that pushed through. Uh, the, the ultimate designation uh, from the RTRP was going to be obtained from taking a competency test getting and maintaining a P-10 and have annual continuing education requirements and maintain current physical contact information so that way they always had at least a, you know, a physical address and the contact information, phone number and email uh, to contact the tax preparer if the, o or the OPR had any questions. But what happened was as of January 13th, 2013, the IRS was enjoined through a decision from the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C., from enforcing RTRP and mandatory CE requirements for most preparers. So what that means is anybody who was getting prepared and getting the testing materials, who were tracking their CE requirements, uh, there is no mandatory RTRP or mandatory continuing education requirements uh, anymore. What the IRS has done now is going for what's called an RTRP replacement. Uh, and it's after that Loving versus IRS decision I was talking about, they've moved towards a voluntary certification process, which is essentially the same thing, but it's completely voluntary. There's no mandatory requirements. Uh, what it's going to be doing is creating what's called the Annual Federal Tax Refresher Course, or the AFTRC, and it's going to cover three domains of tax law. It's going to cover new laws and uh, tax law updates. It's going to cover general review for the things that pretty much stay the same every year. And then a smaller subsection at the end for ethics and practices, pretty much the stuff that you're going to find you're going to be subjected to in the Circular 230. Uh, in reality, this is pretty much almost identical uh, to the test that the enrolled agents have to take called the Special Enrollment Examination, only without the uh, extra focus on the business side of things. It's primarily for individual returns. The requirements for this particular course are 18 credit hours of CE a year, which has been increased from the original 15, a valid uh, P10 number, and the completion of a 100 question course in order to get a, a small bank of your questions. The annual federal tax refresher course itself uh, is going to be presented in whatever format the CE provider chooses, as long as the total hours of CE credit equals six. You know, there's going to be people out there who are going to offer the whole thing in one go, seminar style. There's going to be people who have self-study. There's going to be people who have webinars that are broken down into blocks. When it's done, the 100-question test at the end requires a 70% pass rate and then covers the three domains that we listed before, new law, general law, and ethics. And this voluntary system is going to take effect for the 2015 filing season and onward, and with, has one caveat. It allows qualified individuals that the certification is subject to the OPR and Circular 230. 
Uh, as of right now, anybody with a valid PTIN number is not subject to all the complete rules of the Circular 230 uh, as subject to examination, censure, and disbarring in the same way. This voluntary certification will look prestigious for people who actually go through and complete the testing materials and complete the course, and they can show people you know, that they are a qualified individual, that they have the minimum amount of knowledge, but it does also let them be subject to the OPR and Circular 230 much in the same way as an enrolled agent. Enrolled agents. Now you've heard me say enrolled agents a couple of times. Uh, those of you that have uh, been doing taxes for a while or been partners with us for a while are probably aware of what an enrolled agent is, at least by name. Uh, they're pretty much known as EAs in the industry. It is the only federally recognized designation for being able to represent taxpayers at all administrative levels of the IRS, with the exception that they cannot represent taxpayers in tax court. Technically, there is another designation of people who can take a special course that's offered every two years that lets them advocate for people in tax court without being a lawyer, but uh, I think it has something like an 8% pass rate uh, every two years, and the testing materials are often ten to $20,000 or more. Uh, for everything else beyond tax court, going before and sending letters to the Department of Treasury, going and visiting the IRS in person, getting transcripts, all these other things are all covered by EAs. EAs are bound by Circular 230, and they have continuing education requirements regardless of that court decision, that Loving versus IRS decision that cut the RTRP requirements for everyone else. It has a more stringent requirement that follows a three-year enrollment cycle. That three-year enrollment cycle means that an enrolled agent is going to need to obtain 72 hours of continuing education over a three-year period because the enrollment cycles are every three years. You can't have anything less than 16 hours per year, of which two hours of those are going to have to be over ethics. And if the enrollment begins mid-year or partway through an enrollment cycle, then you're going to have to obtain two hours per month of enrollment and uh, partial month included. So if you get your EA the last day of the month, you need two hours for that month and two hours of ethics each year no matter what. So as long as you're going through and you're getting your continuing education requirements, whether you're using the resources that we have available uh, for partners here through your partner portal and taking the tests and watching the webinars and getting credit and having it reported, uh, if you're not doing that and you're going out and you're finding everything on your own, then you need to make sure if you're an EA that you've got to have that 16, two hours of ethics or at least two per month with two hours of ethics. That's pretty much the hinge point. As long as you satisfy your requirements, you're not going to run afoul of the OPR if they ever ask for any sort of justification uh, in order to keep your enrolled agent status. In order to prove your continuing education uh, you know, is being maintained, your CE provider will require you to provide a PTIN number that they then report uh, your participation to the IRS. Uh, most places, including us, do that electronically at least once a week through a series of forms that we send to them in order to make sure to track and make sure that everybody who is doing continuing education gets all of the, the credit hours reported properly and on time. And as the IRS's system becomes more digitized, as they switch over to more electronic and online services, uh, you should be able to actually see that information reflected inside your PTIN account if you were to log in through the IRS's PTIN portal. Uh, however, despite the fact that your CE provider is going to be sending that information to the IRS on usually a, a weekly or perhaps even monthly basis, uh, you, as the tax preparer, are individually responsible for maintaining the information about the continuing education uh, that you are taking. You need to have the name of the CE provider, uh, the location of the program, which the location of the program, uh, if it's a physical in-person test, which there are some of those that are available uh, through uh, you know, some of the competitor block stores of that nature, they have programs that you can actually physically go and attend classes, uh, whether it's a self-study or whether it's an, uh, an online course. You need to make sure that you have that, that location of the program. Uh, you need to have the course title and the program number. Any valid course registered through the IRS's continuing education portal has a multi-alphanumeric dashed digit uh, program number 
that is going to be changed every single year for each new course uh, that, that is submitted by that particular provider. This one included. Uh, the course materials, uh, you are responsible for maintaining information about those. If there are any materials that are necessary, such as forms or booklets uh, or digital downloads of some kind, the credit hours claimed, the particular dates of your attendance, and the name of any of the instructors who are presenting it. And all of this information, for the most part, is going to be listed on a certificate of completion that is going to be provided by the continuing education provider. If you are doing a continuing education from somewhere other than us, and you don't see the continuing education provider logo, and most of that information is missing, there's a very real likelihood that you know, the course that you just took or the thing that you just spent money on is not going to be valid. So always look for that continuing education provider you know, logo somewhere on there. It's pretty much required for it to be listed, and most people who are making CE want to have it visible uh, in order as like a badge of honor or just to justify that they are actually reporting this information and following all the rules for CE providers. And you're going to have to maintain these things. The continuing education certificates uh, through our partner portal are available pretty much any time after completion. I would recommend if you haven't already to print them off and keep them somewhere or at least save them to uh, your email account or to a Dropbox or an online storage somewhere so that way you can have them if the IRS uh, ever comes asking for them. I've never seen it actually happen where the IRS is trying to justify CE requirements. They've got enough going on. <laughs> I'm sure if anybody's following the, the testimony at Capitol Hill right now, but if the IRS ever does decide to do an audit of the CE providers and the people who are claiming those credit hours, you're going to want to have those things available in order to justify it just to keep yourself safe. Just like preparing returns, keeping copies of documents, IDs, you're going to want to go ahead and keep access to all of these things so that way you can prove it if you need it. Better to have it and not need it than suddenly find yourself needing it and not being able to locate your CE anywhere. Certificate examples, at least from us, tend to look like this. It's going to have your name listed on it, IRS course number listed below it, along with the name for the actual program itself, the date that it was provided, the location. Uh, in this case, you can see it's marked as online and based out of Indianapolis, Indiana, for people who happen to be physically present during the presentation and just lets you know that in accordance with the standards by Circular 230, you've got two CE hours based on two 50-minute hours and uh, your know, signature of the designated official and the date that it applies for. Um, sometimes they're going to come on like pretty stock like this. Some places actually send out something similar to a diploma. Some places it's just kind of looks like a, an online receipt if you've ever done any online shopping. So you should have one of these anytime you complete it. I know we typically mail them out uh, within a couple of days after completion. I'm pretty sure it's actually automated. Uh, if you find yourself not able to locate it, call us, and we can get somebody in there to make sure that you have access to it. Speaking of, inside your partner portal, what you are going to see over on the left-hand side is my CE on the partner portal. It's got archive certificates available 24-7 and you have the ability actually to upload your other CE provider certificates and the information behind them and you could use that to track your own CE and the CE of your employees. So much like uploading documents to the partner portal in order to satisfy a document retention requirements for you know your EFIN purposes or for bank purposes, you're able to upload your own CE. Uh, the, try to make the partner portal the, the one-stop shop for anything tax related, the resources available, and the ability to store documents that you need. Continuing education, it's no exception. And you see down there at the bottom, like I've said before, documentation only needs to be provided in the event that you need to prove the attendance or completion. And in a worst case scenario, we do have records of who attended, uh, how long they attended, the time they attended, and we can always generate the appropriate certificate if for some reason you misplace yours or the feature's not working. P-10 renewal periods. Uh, a, a brief aside, uh, a P-10 is a preparer tax identification number. Anybody who's been preparing returns for at least a year now is definitely, definitely knows what it is. It is a number that the IRS gives that allows you to receive compensation for preparing tax returns uh, during the tax season. It's, a, it's an annual 
uh, an annual thing that you need to do to origin initially register and then renew it uh, for every specific 12-month calendar year. And what this does, this renewal period, uh, when it's talking about it right here, is that you can prepare returns during the 12-month window. So if you get a 2012 P10 or 13 or 14 P10 January to December 31st of that year, you can prepare any return. It's not that you need to go in and get a P10 for each back year. So if someone comes in needing to do a return from 2002, you don't need to get a 2002 P10. You just get the one P10, and you can prepare any return from beginning to the end of that particular year. That initial P10 registration, the first time, 6425. Anybody who's done it before knows the process. You go online to the IRS's website, and you create an account through your email. You verify it. You go through the application, answer a few questions, pay for it, and then a minute or two later, you've got an active P10 number, and you're ready to start preparing. Uh, in worst case scenario where their system doesn't work or there's some sort of holdup uh, with the online system, there is also a, a paper application that can definitely be done, although that typically takes about six to eight weeks in order to process. Once you've done that first P10, any P10 from that point on is going to be $63. $63 flat, it's only a, a dollar and a quarter less, but it's going to be an annual fee that you're going to have to pay for yourself every single year. And if you have employees, uh, whether or not you're paying for it or they're paying for it out of their own pocket, they are going to need to maintain active patents for each year that they're filing taxes as long as they're doing something uh, tax-related for compensation. As an example right here, if you uh, renew or obtain a patent and uh, 2011 and identify the P10 is for the 2012 tax season, that would let you prepare for January 1st to December 31st. Uh, the dates on this probably should be updated right now, but basically, if you were to go get a P10 right now, you could prepare any return you wanted until the end of December of this year. Uh, listening or looking at it right there, if you are getting a P10 this year and you are identifying it for next year for the uh, 2014 uh, tax season or the calendar year 2015, then you'll only be able to start using it from January to December 31st of that particular year. The application, as I mentioned, is almost wholly conducted through the IRS's website. You can go at any time to irs.gov forward slash PTIN and log in or create an account and go through it. Uh, you can see the returns you prepared, at least that's what their, their goal is if they've implemented that. Uh, I saw earlier this year that was partially in place. Like anything the IRS does, it happens to take a little bit of time for them to fully implement these things. See your CE tracking, uh, update your contact information. Uh, this is also where you can put your, your email information so that way uh, you can either put a, a dummy email I've seen some people do that they actually get for specific tax purposes. So, you know, they leave their personal email off of it so they don't get a bunch of spam. Um, the, pop, the possibility to do paper applications exists. Like I said, the IRS heavily discourages their usage. As the IRS moves forward, they're trying to move away from doing paper anything because it just takes too long uh, and it requires man hours. Now, the form to do that is Form W-12. If you're having problems with the P-10 application and you're doing it on your own, you're, you're not working with uh, one of the people here at Federal Direct, one of the account executives that's able to help walk you through it, uh, then you can call the IRS customer service uh, line for the P-10 number, and they will pretty much go through extremes to facilitate the online application process. They will talk you through it, try to diagnose computer issues, uh, send verification emails. They'll do anything that they can in order to get you into that portal so you can do the application there and avoid sending uh, paper form W-12 to them. And regardless of that CE testing, or any of those uh, continuing education requirements and stuff being struck down for all preparers, uh, all preparers, regardless, still need to have a P-10. The IRS was, uh, it was decided in the court case that the IRS does have the statutory authority to make people have a P-10 number. They just can't force people to do CE unless they're one of those professional designations we mentioned earlier. When it comes down to it, uh, by the way, just want to point out that the P-10 is a, is a very important thing. Um, the IRS opens up renewal dates, T-1 
typically sometime in late October, early, early November for the following tax season. So if you're a new partner with us, um, unless you have people you know, busting the door down to, to get in and, and start preparing returns uh, as we speak, um, you can pretty much safely wait. You can you can use the practice returns and play around with your software if it's been installed. You can you know do pretty much anything else uh, and and just wait it out. If you need help, you can always contact us here at the office. What we will do is walk you through it. Uh, I know most of us here have probably done at least over a hundred or two hundred uh, assistances, you know, with the PTN application itself. So it, it's it's by no means strange to anybody here in the office. For enrolled agents and their renewal periods, I mentioned before that there's a, a three-year cycle. Uh, enrolled agents' renewal periods uh, pretty much are determined by the last number of their Social Security number. It does happen in some cases where a person will get a brand new uh, enrolled agent status after completing the special enrollment examination, and then all of a sudden, you know, they've got to renew and send that form in again uh, with the thirty-five dollars the IRS requires in order to get their in order to get their EA status you know, updated for the next three years. For the social security numbers that end in uh, zero through three, the cycle that is existing right now is between the 1st of November of 2012 and the end of October on 31st on 2015. Uh, the due date for renewal by January 31st of 2016, so it's basically got to have it in by the end of January of the following year that your, uh, that your EA expires which the effective date of renewal is going to be April 1st. In fact, the renewal date for any enrolled agent is always going to be April 1st of the year following their expiration. 4, 5, and 6 is just going to bump it up to a different year. In this case, the re date of renewal was January 31st of this year, and the effective date of renewal for people who did go through and renew uh, was a couple months back at the beginning of April. And for everybody else, uh, the next renewal cycle is going to be by January 31st of 2015. So basically anybody with 789 going to need to go from either November to, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> go, go from the opening window for November to January 31st and get that renewed so that way they're good for next year. Uh, the renewal form is done through form 8554. It's a fairly simple form. It just has you put down some contact information, uh, answer a few questions, and you can either do that online or in paper. And the IRS charges a fee of $35 for any sort of initial application or renewal for an enrolled agent. Okay. Now that we've gone through most of the initial things over EAs and, and PTINs, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to what's called due diligence. Uh, due diligence is, is what's really going to be the core of the ethical practices. It's a term that is used to indicate a legal standard of care regarding the process of investigating uh, and completing tax returns or representing any matter whatsoever before the IRS. Pretty much, due diligence represents the set of practices that makes your preparation and representation legal, accurate, and provable. Legal, accurate, and provable. Those three things are very important. It needs to fit the letter of the law uh, or be as close as humanly possible with some interpretation. It needs to be accurate, so your math needs to be good. Uh, you know, you need to make sure that you're using the forms properly to calculate the right, the right numbers to be on certain schedules and various types of credits. For the most part, your software is going to handle the vast majority, 99% of the issues are going to be handled by the software and its auto-calculating fields. And then finally, provable. You know, if you're representing a matter before the IRS or you're doing a tax return, you know, and, and the IRS founds out that someone just walked into your office and said something off the top of their head and there's absolutely no ground whatsoever to stand on. Nothing whatsoever that is going to allow that particular position to be proved as being legal and accurate, then you, you shouldn't do it. That doesn't mean you can't take your taxpayer's word for a lot of things. Uh, Schedule C filers don't uh, don't be dismayed. 
Um, you know, your taxpayer's word, it, it, you're pretty much covered as long as they're signing that 8879 and you're not willfully ignoring anything that you may know about that particular client. But the idea behind it is you want to fit the law, you want to calculate it correctly, and in a worst case scenario, if the IRS comes a knock in that the taxpayer or you as the preparer can prove your position on it. So copies of any of the records that you use to make certain calculations or figuring out the amount of credit that should be applied or any of the documentation that you were researching in order to find a particular stance. I know some people who are doing higher level returns um, pretty much have a membership, if you will, to various like legal forms where they can look up court cases and find out what the actual judicial ruling is on specific aspects of the tax code. Because right now, the tax code, if you were to print it out, 12-point font, single-space, double-sided paper, we're looking at 78,000 sheets of paper. It's a 24-foot stack of paper. So there's a lot of things in there. There's a lot of room. And uh, some people, you know, uh, want to have access to that judicial uh, interpretation to make sure that they cover their bases. This due diligence forms the core of ethics and requirements in the minds of the IRS as far as everything's concerned with Circular 230 and anybody who is subject to the OPR. Due diligence, proper computation of credits, tax, and deductions. I mentioned that your software should pretty much cover you on this unless you are preparing returns by hand like amendments or certain type of worksheets for things like ministers or qualified performing artists or business returns or really old returns that you might not have software for that they want to make sure that you are properly computing it that you're carrying things to the right fields that you're using the right numbers the right rates that you're using the the right fractional amounts for different types of uh, calculations like mileage credits or the amount of um, the amount of tax uh, that's able being taken away by things like child tax credit and such your knowledge that you want you they want you to be able to identify incomplete inconsistent or incorrect information so if someone walks in and they, they got a couple of dependents on the return and you know you, you hear them talking and the name changes three or four times or they can't seem to remember a birth date from somebody that's supposed to be their you know their firstborn child or something uh, if you, you, you hear them talking on the phone to a relative and saying one thing and telling you another when they're preparing a return or they're calculating uh, the full amount uh, for something maybe that should, be, uh, that should be only counted as half on the return. Uh, you know, you're supposed to identify those things. You are the tax preparer. They are coming to you for the knowledge. They're coming to you for your expertise. Um, so they want, the IRS wants to make sure that you are capable of identifying those incomplete, inconsistent and incorrect information and either correcting it or fixing it and they want you to ask the additional questions that are necessary and if at all possible document the answers. Anybody that's been preparing returns for some time has done returns with dependents on it and anybody that's done returns with dependents on it has had to deal with earned income credit and child tax credit. Uh, this is especially true for people in lower income areas or in places where the families are just traditionally larger. And several of the changes that the IRS have made to forms over the years have attempted to simplify the record collection process uh, for recording this type of information. Notably, the IRS has the, the form 8867, and the 8867 has a, a series of questions. And those series of questions, you, you answer them uh, to the best of your ability uh, in order to document exactly what steps and stages you took to identify certain information on the return. And a, a few slides from now, I'll actually have a couple pages from the 8867 uh, visible, so that way we can actually go through them. And the IRS themselves as well are uh, playing around and possibly going to be instituting additional questionnaires for things like child tax credit or maybe even Schedule Cs. Nothing quite set in stone yet, but the idea being that the uh, IRS wants you to try and make sure that you are keeping a record of, of how you calculated this information, what justification that you have for doing the things on the return that you are doing and any other thing necessary that might substantiate a position that either you or a return that you prepared has. Record retention is another aspect of due diligence. Uh, anybody that's um, you know licensing an EFIN out or has their own EFIN is under or 
is under a, a requirement to maintain certain records. Uh, there are record retention requirements for the IRS. There are record retention requirements for the banks. There are a bunch of different record retention requirements uh, that you have to satisfy in order to make sure that you can prove that you filed the return and that you had justification for a lot of the stuff when you were preparing it. If you are doing a paper or electronic form, it's got to be available for three years past the due date of the return or from when the return was filed, whichever is later. So whenever you send that return out, the documentation, the signature pages, the IDs, the W-2s, your schedules, you're going to want to have every one of those things available in some form or another for at least three years. Now, I know some people like to just keep a, a physical filing cabinet with a folder stuffed with a bunch of paper and keep that for their own records. Other people have things like the, the neat desk scanners or just use a regular scanner and, and scan them in and keep them on a hard drive or in their email or on their phones even in some cases. Uh, partners with Federal Direct do have access to document storage. Uh, the document storage feature that is available is for anybody. It doesn't matter what partnership level you are, you do have the ability to upload documents and create uh, small entries, uh, sort of a ledger if you would, for any client that you prepare. Even if they don't ever get, ever get filed, you can put their information in, you can store the documentation on there. And I would actually take a second here to mention that it's probably a good idea to get in the habit of scanning everything that a taxpayer brings in or having a copy of it and then putting it in there. For one, when you are contacting Federal Direct Support staff for tax issues, it's usually a lot easier for us to talk about a form and what to do with it if we've got a copy of it over on our side that we can open up and take a look at and then discuss how to put it on a return as well in a you know, the case that you maybe have an office catastrophe, like a like a fire, which we've had a few partners who've had that happen, or a card or hard drive or computer failure, uh, you have a backup copy. Anything that we have that's uploaded to our partner portal is redundantly backed up and maintained uh, in secure off-site storage facilities, encrypted, so that way there's no risk whatsoever that anybody else is going to be able to touch it, anybody else is going to be able to see it. Uh, or that it's going to be lost. It's going to be there for as long as electricity and the computers exist. When you are taking these forms and you are scanning them and you are saving them, you also need to make sure that your documentation shows how you um, how you calculated certain things, how you ask questions, the explanations for it, interview sheets, diaries. Your partner portal does also have a stack of interview sheets available in English or Spanish for everything from itemized deductions to Schedule C businesses to just general overall interview sheets that you can print out and have the client fill out if you want to keep a copy of it. The idea being that you want to make sure that you have a clean paper trail that shows exactly who came in, what you did for them, and what they used to prove who they were, and how you were able to reach certain decisions on the return, like how much money they made, how the business was calculated, how the kids were put on the return. Documenting those additional questions, as I mentioned before, goes on to specific entry areas of the Form 8867. 8867 is available in all tiers of the software that's available. Um, some of the older software that we had available had it hidden through a little plus menu on the forms tree on the left hand side. In either case the questions are always there. This form uh, initially was something that was kept with the signature pages kept on the client side but now the IRS actually does receive the 8867 and uses the answers on the 8867 as part of their automatic verification process when it comes time for them to flag returns for review or for maybe potential audits or additional questions. The 8867, in particular, pages 3 and 4, most important pages that are going to be on the entire document, that 8867, page 3 and 4 are going to have the questions related to the dependents, due diligence requirements, uh, disability, and Schedule C income that's on the return. As well, inside the software, if you are using a desktop software, you do have a diary feature that's available via hitting the F7 key on the top of your keyboard, which will open up a little window. And in that little window, there's a little tiny button that lets you click and you can add notes in it. Anybody who's using the online software platforms, however, will notice a diary tab listed at the top of the screen as an icon that you can open and place information in. And it's a really good habit to get in there and put 
information in that you're going to need like when they came in or any additional scenarios like client is going to bring in additional W2s, please wait to send. Things of that nature so that way you, you have a, an understanding of exactly what's going on, especially when you start getting into the higher tier levels of preparation when you're doing two, three, four, five hundred, maybe even a thousand returns like some partners are capable of getting done. Uh, it can be very easy for you to forget exactly what was going on with any particular person during the year. So it's always a good idea to make sure to use the diary feature whenever you can. And it is as simple, uh, the due diligence requirements are keeping these, if you're not using a diary, that you can have a Word file that you can archive with a physical file. You can have a piece of paper that you scribble notes on. As long as you have some kind of record that you made or your preparer made, uh, if you're you know, running a business and you've got employees <clears throat> that they have with the return and store it, that's, that's really all that it needs to be. It does not have to have a physical presence. It does not have to have a physical presence at all. You can have everything completely digital. There are offices out there who use digital signature pads and have clients sign things electronically and never once even print off a single sheet of paper the entire tax year. Uh, it's definitely possible, especially as more offices are going wireless. Uh, there is no requirement for you to be forced to keeping anything physical. So don't worry about having a, a sheet of paper uh, physically printed and kept in a filing cabinet. If you're wanting to go with the paperless option, you are more than well aware or more, more than capable of pulling that off uh, without facing any sort of problem from the IRS. 8867, page three. The first two pages inside the software that yeah, partners use are actually done automatically. They're, they're pretty much questions about filing status and, and uh, things of that nature, presence in the United States, etc. It's once you start getting to pages three and four that you actually have to go through and start answering these, uh, these questions. This part right here is part four, which is the bottom half of page three. And it's got a series of six questions listed right there on the front. Yes, no, and does not apply in a couple of cases. And I'm just going to run through those one at a time real quick, just to give you an idea of exactly what they are, what they mean, and the type of, uh, the type of responses that you should be filling out, things you should be aware of. First things first. Did you complete this 8867 with the current information that was provided by the taxpayer or reasonably obtained by you, yes or no? I don't see why anybody would go through the trouble of telling the IRS, no, I didn't complete this form with current information or I didn't reasonably obtain it. And that's pretty much just admitting to just being completely blasé with your, with your tax preparation practice and it's going to put you onto a radar if a, if a pattern of this starts to happen. Uh, the IRS is moving electronically heavily. Uh, the IRS in the 80s used to be able to audit 5 6% of returns. Now they're lucky to get one out of about every 10,000. In fact, the vast majority of the review letters that the IRS sends out on an annual basis are completely automated, done through their system, and not a single human being physically does any part of it. It just prints off letters, seals them up, sticks them in mailing uh, slots to go out to the people. And since that happens to be the case, uh, the computer can flag patterns in preparation and bring people under scrutiny. I've had a couple of partners subject to IRS, you know, kind of asking some questions about their practice and making sure that they're following uh, best practices. And you don't want to answer no to that question. You want to make sure that you are asking taxpayer questions or that you somehow have a reasonable basis for the information that you're obtaining. Uh, maybe you know the person very closely because they're a friend or a family member, or you know maybe they come in with their kids and the kids are calling them mom and dad. You know, like those right there, fairly reasonable basis. You're going to want to make sure to cover your, your own basis, however, and document these things, ask these questions. Don't let it slip by. It only takes a few minutes of time, so make sure to stay on top of it. Next one, did you complete the EIC worksheet that's found on the 1040 series instructions or the worksheet that provides the same information as those forms? The EIC worksheet uh, that is available in the software <clears throat> is going to be something that's pretty much auto-calculated, but for the most part what they're wanting to make sure of is that you're identifying that you have the proper relationship category for any of the dependents on the return, that you've got the appropriate age, birth date, social name, um, how long that they lived at the home, all of the different things that go behind it. Uh, if they are over 18, that you've properly designated whether that they are permanently and totally disabled or are a student in order to get EIC. EIC is one of the most fraudulent tax credits that exists out there. Uh, the IRS is caught up somewhat 
on enforcing it, but during its uh, worst periods, we were talking 40 to 50 percent of returns with the earned income credit were filed uh, incorrectly, and that's a little over $20 billion a year. Uh, $20 billion a year is nothing to laugh at, so the IRS pays a lot of attention to making sure that EIC is, is strictly upheld to uh, within the means that they have. And one of those things that you need to do to protect yourself is make sure that you've got those worksheets. We do have other continuing education courses, both archived and in the future, that are going to specifically cover due diligence and EIC, as well as just dependence by themselves. Two separate webinars covering different aspects of the same topic. You'll get invites for it. So, you know, if you're, if you're waiting for it, we'll send them out over the next couple of months. Otherwise, we do have the archived versions available for your own personal knowledge if you're interested. That EIC worksheet, got a series of questions on it in the software, yes or no questions, check boxes. The things that are important are going to be highlighted in red. So you have to go in, you have to complete them, you have to make sure that you know, you've got the questions answered before the return will even let it send, and it instructs you with multiple levels of error checking to make sure that you are doing it properly. 22, if any qualifying child was not a son or daughter, did you ask why the parents were not claiming the child and document the answer? The IRS prefers that a parent is claiming the dependent on a return. That's just their general preference. Uh, in tiebreaker rules for dependents, the uh, preference is always going to go to the parents. Um, anybody who is claiming a dependent on the return for EIC purposes uh, that is not uh, a father uh, father-son, father-daughter, mother-son, mother-daughter relationship, uh, and that can be step, that can be foster, that can be adopted. As long as a parental relationship exists, you're good. If not, you want to ask why. Why are the parents not claiming the child? In a lot of cases, you'll have an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent who is watching, you know, watching their grandchildren, especially in lower income areas. Uh, a lot of families live together. Maybe the parents just don't have enough money. Maybe they're in between jobs. Either way, you're going to want to go ahead and document that answer. Sometimes you'll even find situations like maybe a sibling is watching his younger siblings because of either an incarceration or uh, unfortunately even a death in the family. As long as there's a valid answer and you've documented it, you're good. So if they're not the son or daughter, ask a question, write a little note down or put it in the diary, be done with it, you're covered. If the answer is yes to that question, if you did ask why and you did document the question or the question and answer, um, did you explain the tiebreaker rules and the possible consequences of another person claiming your client's qualifying child? If you are dealing with someone who is claiming somebody who's not their biological child, you're going to want to take a few seconds to let them know about the tiebreaker rules. I'm not going to go into too much depth because we cover that in other webinars, but long story short, tiebreaker rules basically match up as to who spent the most time with, or who spent the most time watching that particular dependent, and usually that person gets it. If that's too hazy or it's not definite, then it will typically go down to uh, who has the most money. Um, and usually the person with the most money will get to claim that dependent on their particular return. And then there are other considerations like divorce decrees and uh, separation agreements, community pop property rules, and things of that nature. Um, but in almost all of these cases, the parents are going to be preferred. So if you do have somebody claiming a dependent that is not their biological child, it is possible that a parent could file a return and then get the money even if they don't really seem to have much of a leg to stand on because of those tiebreaker rules. You just want to very briefly maybe study those on your own time, let the other person know when they come in about those rules because the IRS really wants you to make sure to explain those for every person who is attempting to claim someone who is not their own child. Did you ask this taxpayer? any additional questions that are necessary to meet your knowledge requirement and then see the instructions before answering. And the instructions are right down at the bottom that says to comply with the EIC knowledge requirement you can't know or have a reason to like suspect or know that any of the information that you've been given is false or inaccurate or that their eligibility is off. So if you hear somebody in your lobby arguing saying hey I need to I only got two kids you have four, let me borrow one so I can get the most EIC, that you're not just going to let that happen. That's what they're really trying to avoid, is they're really trying to avoid you just 
pretending, you know, slip of the tongue, someone says something, and you just ignore it. They want you to be vigilant. They want you to exercise that due diligence and make sure that you are doing things accurate, legal, and provable, because otherwise you are just as guilty as they are, and the IRS does have some pretty severe penalties uh, when it comes to people who deliberately uh, file an incorrect return or who have a fraudulent position. So you're going to answer that yes, no, does not apply. Does not apply is a safe answer for some of these questions. Sometimes it literally does not apply. If you've got a mother and father in with their own children, you're not going to answer yes or no to either one of these questions right there because it doesn't matter. The, you know, it's their biological children. And if there's no other questions that are necessary because everything checks out, you can put does not apply. I've never seen anybody get in trouble from the IRS for answering does not apply. Plain and simple, I have not seen it happen. It doesn't mean that it's impossible. It's just unlikely. What I have seen, however, are people getting in trouble for answering the top one incorrectly because you do want to make sure that you are reasonably obtaining this information. And then the last question, did you document these questions and the answers? If you ask a question that seems to be required, write it down, take the answer down. Even if you've got to create your own question sheet that you're going to ask everybody and just have copies of it so you can just check boxes and move on, it's a good idea to make sure to document these questions and the answers because it's very possible for a tax uh, client of yours to claim you know, that you played foul. You hear every year about tax preparers getting the ax or, or going to jail for, for fraudulent practices. You don't want to be one of those people because you accidentally did not keep the documentation. You want to make sure that you're exercising due diligence, proper record retention, keep your bases covered. Okay? Page four. This one will be a lot quicker. It's just going to cover little sections for uh, residency, disability, and documents or other information. Uh, anytime that you are claiming EIC, uh, you're supposed to ask questions in order to verify the residency of the children. It does not mean that a taxpayer needs to have the documents that are listed in this section. It is not required for a taxpayer to walk in with a full-on audit-proof stack of documents that prove it's their children. Um, if there is an issue of residency or you do have questions, you can stand on these things. It's a good idea for a tax, or a tax client to bring them in with their return. Um, but these right here are just a variety of documents that do qualify for residency. School records, landlord records, health care provider statements, medical child care, placement, social services, worship statements, tribal statements, employer statements, other. And then finally, did not rely on any documents but made notes and file and did not rely on any documents. Uh, to give you an example, I prepare returns for my family every year. My brother, uh, has a couple of kids that he's had for several years now. I don't need to rely on any documents. I know exactly where they live because I visit them on the holidays. I know everything about them that I need to know from a tax perspective. I can safely mark did not rely on any documents. And the same thing, someone comes into your office with a couple of kids and, you know, they're calling them mom and dad, they're hanging out, you know, they're acting like a family, and, you know, and you believe and you have every reason to believe that they're a completely valid family unit and you don't need uh, to have, you know, a notarized document from a, a government agency that says this child belongs with this particular person. Okay, this is a lot less of a strict standard, but if they do bring them in, mark it, keep a copy for your records. Same thing for disability. It is a very common tactic to claim disability on a dependent in order to get that dependent's uh, EIC credit on that particular return. Uh, because anybody who is permanently and totally disabled who is being claimed for EIC can be any age as long as they fit all the other categories. Uh, you know, there are, you'll, you'll see stories about tax preparers who've got 60 and 70 year old brothers and, and so on and so forth on a return who are marked as disabled that they're getting credit for. The IRS tracks these things. Uh, they don't have like a, a live family tree that keeps this information there um, that they can use from a year to year basis or anything else like that. But they do keep a vigilant eye towards claiming disability on a dependent, especially if that person's never had that dependent on a return before. So if you do have somebody who's claiming to be disability, you can go ahead and mark that you did not rely on any documents or made notes and file. You can stand on the client's word. It is entirely possible for you to do that and get away with it. Not a big problem. You don't need to have a medical record, but it is a very good idea if they have those documentation uh, files present that you take a copy of it and use it for your own records so that way 
nobody can say that you just made something up. Other information, other documents, other things that are going to be required. This last section is specifically for Schedule C's. As well as, uh, you know, disabled or my, my kids in school, EIC fraud tactics, it is another common tactic uh, to use self-employed income to either reduce taxable income or increase taxable income to get the most amount of EIC that is available for that particular tax situation. The IRS calls this EIC maximization, and it is something that happens with a large number of people a year. Like I said, conservative estimates put it in the range of about $20 billion. Uh, that being said, if someone comes in with a Schedule C uh, income, you can rely on their word. You know, they sign the 8879 at the end of the return that basically gives you permission to file. They stand on the words and the documentation provided. The 8879, the signature pages say, I came in, I gave Johnny Tax Preparer my information, he prepared the return, I looked at it, I agreed with it, and I'm going to give him permission to sign as me. That's what that form is doing. And what this form is doing is saying, how did you get the EIC and the Schedule C on the same return? Did you have a business license? Did you have 1099s? Did you have records of gross receipts? A lot of people don't maintain proper documentation for their particular business. It's unfortunate, but not everybody is an accountant or has an interest in, in keeping an accountancy uh, up to date. They just say they made this much, etc. However, what you can do is have a little worksheet. We do have interview sheets that are available in your partner portal, and that partner portal uh, worksheet allows you to have the client fill that information in and sign off on it. So that right there would count as a record of a gross receipt or a, a summary of income from the taxpayer that lets you have a leg to stand on and saying, whoa, I did not put this fake information on the return. I used this document right here that the client filled out. And that way, the, the burden can be shifted to them, so that way, if the taxpayer does happen to be doing something that is, you know, that is wrong, that you're not going to get in trouble for it as long as it can be proven that you are doing your, your due diligence, that you are paying attention, you are asking the questions, and you are taking copies of any documents that you need it. Due diligence. Knowledge of a client's omissions. If a client omits something, or forgets to, to mention something or doesn't have enough information, it is your duty as a tax preparer to inform the client of the error or the consequence for things like noncompliance or omission of information and what the IRS can, can do to people. Uh, the IRS is not a real-time processing station. Uh, I mean, they, they accept returns when they come in, they issue refunds, their automatic system tags and flags things and sends letters out, but it is very possible for things to slip by the IRS for some time. So people who are used to the old system or people who have done things in the past will sometimes attempt to make the same mistakes on a return and get them sent in expecting it to go through. But the IRS eventually catches everyone that is doing something wrong. Uh, that's, that's pretty much the way it is. The more and more that they switch over to these automated systems, the easier it is to spot t trends. They use data averaging and a bunch of other mathematical formulas in order to determine how much money certain types of people should make in certain businesses and in certain areas of the country. And the IRS will sit on an incorrect return for some time and let that accumulate interest and penalties and things of that nature and then suddenly send a huge tax bill to a person because it takes them a while to process these things. To give another example, uh, I do know uh, somebody who was just uh, late on their documentation. They were filing a, a return uh, for a business. They had all the paperwork, but they were taking their time. I warned the taxpayer of the particular problem, but he waited and he waited and he waited. Finally, after about a year of waiting, gets some materials to me. I file the business return. Turns out he gets a $12,000 penalty. $12,000 is a lot of money for someone who's in the business that he's in, and it came to him as quite a shock. was able to get that removed uh, through, a, through a process here by using uh, you know, the abilities as an EA, but long story short is, is that noncompliance to your tax return and your issues can cause problems. The IRS, as well as sitting on a return that is you know, waiting uh, to, to be fixed or that is wrong and sitting on letting it grow interest, they will also sit on 
an error in the taxpayer's favor. Okay, so you got to keep in mind that it works both ways. The IRS will wait a long time to get more money to charge somebody as well. They will uh, not contact a person when they owe that person money. So it is up to you to make sure to let the client know consequences for noncompliance or omission and let them know the way that the system works and what to watch out for and to sort of be their guide through this process because the vast majority of people know absolutely nothing about taxes other than a topical interest in maybe something like uh, you know, TurboTax or something of that nature. You need to determine the accuracy of an oral or a written statement that is made to a client or to the IRS. Under due diligence, this is called a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt in, in this case means that it's fairly likely that the accuracy of something that you are either telling the IRS or that you are writing to the IRS uh, that is, or that you are making to a client uh, has a leg to stand on. Okay? Reasonable doubt is very is a very important thing. Um, you 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 know what you know about the tax law. You help them out as best as you can. Uh, but there's a lot of code. I mentioned earlier, seventy eight thousand pages. That is a lot of reading. Not everybody on the planet has any idea about the full scope of everything. So you want to determine it to the best of your knowledge. And if there's some wiggle room or some room for interpretation, you need to make sure that your position, that your statements, that your advice that you're giving out uh, actually does have a leg to stand on. A reasonable doubt is, is very important. As well, we've got a little subsection here that's mentioning things to notaries. Anybody who's a notary, uh, you cannot be the preparer and notarize documents for a client in which you have an interest. It's a conflict of interest to use your powers as a notary to verify the accuracy of something that is going to directly benefit you or one of your clients. A good example is going to be an ITIN application with ID copies and things of that nature. Anybody who's doing ITIN applications is aware of, you know, requirements for documents that need to be provided during this application process and the rules covering them. You can't notarize documents. Um, for your clients if you are the one preparing them. If another preparer's clients come into you and you notarize them, fine. Or if you send your clients to somebody else to get their paperwork notarized, that's fine. You can't do it yourself. Conflict of interest, just make sure to keep that in mind for anybody out there who happens to be a notary. As a preparer, under the due diligence rules, you need to make sure that you do not sign a return as a preparer that does not have a reasonable basis. Reasonable doubt, reasonable basis. In this particular case, a reasonable basis, uh, if it does not have it, is that a tax return preparer knew or reasonably should have known that there was not a reasonable belief that the position would more than likely be sustained or not, or more than more likely than not, be sustained on its merits. It's called the 50% rule. If your knowledge of the issue is 50-50 over your interpretation, that's reasonable basis. Anything less, not reasonable basis. Okay, that doesn't mean that you get to interpret it uh, creatively. The IRS has a lot of different frivolous positions that we'll talk about in a minute that you definitely can't use as a defense uh, for some of the people out there who are, you know, taxes theft or uh, any of the different rules over whether or not it's legal or not. Long story short, you know, you have something, maybe a client comes in and they're running a business and they have an expense. And this expense was for the business, but it's a little bit personal too. So you take the information that you've been given, you look at the code, and you think that this particular deduction, for instance, would definitely still be able to at least partially be on the return uh, at a 50-50 rate. You know, so you're, fit, you're at least 50-50 on whether or not it's going to work. So you go ahead and you put it on the return and you file it. If it ever gets audited and the IRS comes knocking on your door wanting to know whether you had a reasonable basis, as long as it was just as equally likely to be accepted or rejected, you're good. If they find out that you were talking to the client and you are twisting the definition of words or something of that nature in order to make that return go through, that's not a reasonable basis. That's something that you can definitely get in trouble for. 
You also need to make sure, as a preparer, that you do not sign a return that contains reckless or intentional disregard of IRS rules or regulations. And I'm also going to throw in there any sort of judicial rulings or anything of that nature uh, that, that you may or may not know about. A pattern of conduct can be used to identify if reckless practices exist by a preparer or by a company of preparers. Anybody that's ever heard of instant tax? Instant tax uh, was a, a national tax franchise chain that had offices uh, all over the country, in particular the South, and it came to light through uh, grand inquiries and investigations that they were instructing their own preparers on how to commit tax fraud, EIC maximization, and how to question and phrase things that would allow them to get the most money for people in an illegal sense. Okay, that pattern of conduct allowed the IRS to take the entire business down, and several people are serving very long sentences. Um, last year, uh, there was a, a couple out of Detroit that was committing a tax fraud scheme, and I believe that they both had somewhere in the realm of 200 years consecutive. So we're talking about very serious penalties for defrauding the government. Uh, regardless of whatever your stance is on in, the incarceration system in this country, long story short is if it's towards the government, it's probably not going to be in your interest to pursue that, uh, that particular activity. So don't sign a return that is reckless or disregards the rules, is deliberately fraudulent, has tax, uh, you know, fraud just stamped all over it. Bad, uh, bad places for claiming deductions, wrong credits, don't do any of those things, don't sign it, don't risk your own freedom and that of everyone else around you uh, that, that knows you uh, so that way you can help one client get money and put yourself at risk for some jail time. Last and in that same vein is that the return cannot be signed if it contains an unreasonable or a frivolous position. An unreasonable or a frivolous position is, is not just reckless disregard, it's not just ignoring this tax rule and throwing something and seeing what sticks. It is deliberately uh, frivolous, fraudulent, it goes against case law, it goes against precedent, it goes against the interpretation of the rules, and examples of frivolous positions are going to be listed right here. Uh, paying in federal income taxes voluntary. Filing a tax return is voluntary. Uh, personal service income, like income that you are receiving from performing services for people on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis is not taxable. Uh, only federal government employees are required to pay income tax. Uh, that you are refusing to pay taxes based upon personal or uh, religious beliefs. That the entire concept of the income tax is unconstitutional or that the IRS is not a legitimate agency of the United States. The uh, the thing about any of these particular uh, positions, and I like the description for each one of them, uh, is that the IRS has pretty much already beaten an attempt at it in the past. Okay, uh, That's the, the long and short of it. Uh, the income tax being voluntary, filing tax returns voluntary, you'll see a lot of uh, you know, self-help books and e-books and things that are offered by people through uh, late night telemarketing that, that show you a trick to avoid paying income taxes. Don't fall for it. Don't waste your money. It's a waste of time. Long story short is that the, the history of case, uh, case law and precedent is going to be overwhelmingly against you. And the next slide, first line. Any attempt at a frivolous position has likely already been attempted unsuccessfully in the past. Whether or not you're able to read the original law and come to some interpretation that seems to favor your particular position, it's very likely that your own attempt to do uh, a tax avoidance scheme of some kind has already been done by someone, has already been judged against, and now there is case law that basically says, here's how we interpret that original rule. So don't try it. It's going to fail all the time. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This includes every single example that's listed on the prior page. Any attempts at any one of those examples will result in the IRS deferring to their prior cases and rulings, their judicial precedent, and their established case law. And then unless, in the smallest possible chance, that you have some sort of new method, new reason, new interpretation, new judgment, or any other particular aspect that you can involve a petition to tax court, any attempt that you take uh, the IRS to court for over one of those previously adjudicated issues will involve the court 
dismissing the case, deferring to their previous judgments and precedent, and then likely subjecting you to a significant stack of penalties and uh, legal repercussions for attempting it. Um, usually people who are doing these things get like one go. You know, one go that the IRS will, will let you get by with, with a stern finger pointing and a warning that says, do not ever attempt to do this again in the past. And uh, depending upon the severity of the offense, it can go from that to fining to actual court cases. Tax preparers and payers may possibly then be liable for penalties from attempting to advance any of those positions. So if you have someone who's in there uh, to do a return and he's of the taxes are completely unconstitutional aspect, uh, don't get yourself tied up in it. Don't let yourself get subject to penalties, possible jail time, censure, disbarment, or any of these other things uh, over somebody who is going to be attempting to pull something that has no chance at all of ever succeeding in any fashion whatsoever. Uh, just do yourself a favor, don't get involved with it, just you know, say I'm sorry but you know, go somewhere else. Frivolous position penalties are called Title 26 penalties. And these particular penalties, uh, they, they start uh, and then they escalate up depending upon the severity. For a taxpayer relying on a frivolous argument, $100,000 fine cap on individual returns. So you come in, and maybe you got somebody who's of that taxes are illegal position, and, and he's a, a high wage earner. He didn't pay a single cent of tax all year, uh, and he's trying to advance his position. When they finally get around to charging him for it, assuming they don't actually have you know court fees and other things to deal with, you're looking at up to a hundred thousand dollar fine on top of any taxes that you owe. On top, okay, that's a lot of money. Five hundred thousand dollar fine for corporate returns, criminal prosecution. Felony tax evasion, five years. That's five years of your life that you could be sitting in a penitentiary for attempting to advance an argument uh, that's frivolous uh, when you know the overwhelming uh, case law says that you shouldn't have even attempted it in the first place. That's part of your duty and due diligence is to warn people of things like that, to warn people of those particular positions. I would like to take a second and state that a frivolous argument is not just uh, is not just tax fraud. A frivolous argument is attempting to evade tax or to do something on a tax return that is illegal by using a, a constructed set of arguments that, that go against those particular precedents in case law. If someone's just, uh, dare I say it, unintelligent and not doing things properly, they're not going to be subject to a $100,000 fine. There's a difference between negligence or not knowing the rules or just calculating something wrong versus attempting to stand behind a frivolous argument. These right here are particularly for those frivolous arguments, not for negligence, not for bad calculations, not for just misinterpreting things incorrectly. This is for a deliberate attempt to make a frivolous argument. Tax preparers, however, who do know of a frivolous position and still filed the return will receive either the greater of a thousand dollars or fifty percent of the income realized from the act. So if you have somebody come in and you do the return, uh, maybe it's a personal return, you charge 300 something dollars, which is pretty average across the country, and you get a frivolous position behind it, you still file the return, you're going to either get a thousand dollar penalty or half the money you made from it. So there we go, that's half the money that you made at the very minimum uh, already gone or a thousand dollars. Willful or reckless conduct, five thousand dollar minimum penalty, and these are going to be per return. Okay, per return penalties. It's a, a fairly serious thing, especially for offices that have a lot of returns that come in, uh, you know, that you can get charged this penalty all the way up as, as well as being subject to censure, disbarment, and potential legal uh, ramifications when the, if the IRS is interested in bringing a case from you. Like I said earlier, a couple of people this summer, a couple hundred years. I don't think anybody wants to have 200 years on a, on a federal tax evasion sentence uh, you know, stacked up consecutively for all the returns they prepared. So don't stand behind a frivolous position and you'll be fine. Preparer penalties, this is also authorized under Title 26. Preparer penalties are just small penalties that are, you know, missteps in your particular uh, preparation process. $50 per incident fines, failure to provide a copy to the taxpayer. You're supposed to provide a copy to the taxpayer when the return is filed. Anybody who's been using the, uh, the, 
silver or quick start packages before had to wait until the return was processed in house here in order to get that going forward everybody will be able to have a copy of the return available from the moment that they finish the interview to provide to the tax preparer it does not need to be a physical copy you don't need to print it off uh, as people move towards electronic storage and uh, electronic documentation uh, you can provide email copies you can print returns to PDF and save a copy of it on your return and email it to them that way they have a copy of it so a few months later when it comes time for some of your people to get either copies for mortgage uh, get copies for school or to know what their AGI is so they can complete their FAFSA um, you know you have uh, access to it or if you've given it to them electronically they should have it in an email inbox another fifty dollar Princeton fine failure to sign the return as the tax preparer they have to have your signature at the bottom of either the return itself on a paper file that you prepared or on the 8879 or its uh, equivalent forms for any return that you sign as prepare. If you are responsible for the bulk of calculation or the bulk of assistance or the bulk of information that is used to complete this return, you're going to need to sign it as a tax preparer which leads us to the next one that you also need to include your PTIN number on every single return that you prepare. Now, the PTIN number being on the bottom of the return and being accurate, uh, some people, especially in offices with a lot of preparers, might have the preparer's PTIN on it that originally prepared the return. The idea is to have a valid PTIN holder as the preparer, the person who's going to be taking responsibility for the content of that return at the bottom of the return whenever they file it okay so make sure that all of your people have PTINs if they're preparing returns now if you have a document intake an interviewer that's not actually completing the return that's not actually doing the calculations that's just taking the information down even if they're still in the software putting the information in and then someone else finishes it that person does not need a PTIN okay they don't need to have their name on the bottom of it they don't need to stand behind it they're just taking the information in so if you do have an office and you have a bunch of different employees, just uh, keep in mind that only the people that are going to need the PTINs are the ones who are going to be completing the return, presenting it as completed to the tax preparer, and standing on their own as a preparer in order to let that person sign and then let the return go through the system. Okay, You can also get a penalty for failing to retain copies or a list of the returns prepared. Now, this doesn't mean you need to have a, an Excel or a Word spreadsheet with name, date, and all that information. For the most part, as long as you're filing a return, you can op you open up your software, and you'll see a big list of everybody that you've prepared during the year, and that counts. Uh, as well, when you're e-filing returns through the desktop software in particular, you will get a little window that pops up right before you get the ability to hit the send button that will have a list of everybody that you're sending. And you can save that to PDF or you can print a copy of that as an additional uh, set of protection to make sure that you show not only that you have this person's return prepared, but this is when you initially filed the return. And then the failure to file correct information is also a $50 print and fine. Uh, you know, if they really wanted to go after you, you know, you got the wrong name on the return, they could get you for that. Or that you were putting a, you know, d wrong W-2 information on there, they could get you for that. It's very uncommon that that happens to be the case, but they do have the ability statutorily to go in and charge you uh, an instant fine for failing to have the, inf or the correct information on the return. Going up the scale... $500 per instant fines include endorsing a tax client's refund check or failure to use due diligence in calculating EITC. These prepare penalties I've listed are not all of them. These are just the most important ones, the ones that are pertinent to the vast majority of our preparers. Uh, you can see the link down at the bottom, irs.gov, tax pros, article, etc., etc. Uh, whenever this uh, set of uh, documents is available on the website and actually the last year's archive is available as well so you can log into your CE and, and take a look at it and open this up and copy and go to that particular article you can see a list of all the preparer fines and uh, penalties that are available but going back to that $500 per instant fine those two big ones failure to use due diligence in calculating EITC they find out that you're just letting anything under the sun slide on uh, a return and letting these people get money uh, you can be hit with $500 per return and that's in addition to any of the above returns or standing behind frivolous positions these things can stack up pretty heavy the IRS just like uh, just like prosecutors or criminal prosecutors for the state like to take everything throw everything at you and see what sticks okay and some of them can get pretty big 
So make sure to use your due diligence. Make sure to stand behind, document, ask questions, and uh, don't do a return if you're not comfortable with it going through. And endorsing a tax client's refund check. Under no circumstance whatsoever, under at all, I mean, unless you're doing your own return, uh, are you allowed to endorse or obtain any portion of a client's money? People who are using bank products uh, are typically unaware that the bank has gone through a very complicated and multi-million dollar process with the IRS to verify that they are capable of receiving money and cutting out your preparer fees and sending them to the right places. And they can pull that off because their banks are licensed and protected by FDIC. They're subject to the rules for the different banks. They're subject to scrutiny, uh, annual software updating requirements. They're, they're under a lot of stuff that costs millions of dollars and requires a very highly uh, skilled team of people working every day of the year full time to make sure that they're allowed to do that. You don't have that. Nobody who's their average Joe tax preparer has that ability. Don't sign a tax client's check. Don't endorse it. Don't cash it. Don't use the split refund to put part of it into your bank account. That's $500 per instant fine and opening you up to a world of trouble. As well, uh, you know, the client themselves can, you know, initiate investigations or call and complain on you or against you, you know, on their behalf and, and get all the money that you put into your account uh, given right back to them if you don't go through the established channels. So don't sign their checks. Don't put any of their money into your bank account. Uh, putting money into your bank account, uh, that the couple I was talking about that had a couple hundred years in prison, uh, that was exactly what they were doing. They were preparing returns, and then they were shuffling the money into their own personal account and then giving what they deemed necessary to the people. Uh, that right there will be the quickest way to land yourself in prison uh, doing this unless you're doing something with corporate returns that's like really obscene. So don't do it. Keep yourself safe. Go through the established channels or let the IRS send a check and collect money up front if you're not using a bank product. Never, ever endorse a check or put it in your own bank account. Sanctions. Beyond charging fees and penalties and potential legal actions, the IRS has sanctions. And there are different levels of sanctions that, uh, that the IRS can impose. Uh, a censure is the first one. It's a public reprimand. You're still subject, uh, you're still able to practice, but you're subject to conditions on that practice. So the IRS gets you in trouble and says, hey, you are doing this thing. Now you can no longer prepare these types of returns. It's, uh, it's something that can be searched publicly. This type of stuff is available for public access. So if you do something that gets you censured, anybody uh, and their mother can go and find out uh, what you did, look it up, and have a record of it. So unless you feel comfortable having that information sitting out there available to the public, don't do something that's going to get you censured. Okay? Suspension is the next step. And the suspension basically says that your right to practice is pulled. Okay? It's typically temporary. The right to practice can be reinstated, but may be subject to conditions. Usually this involves, uh, usually this involves an appeal. They'll send a letter to you saying you can't practice anymore, you can't represent people, that all your clients are now no longer your clients, and give you an option to appeal or send a letter or some kind of process to allow yourself to you know, go through and get yourself back into the game. But you still may then be subject to conditions. And just like censure, this is also considered public and available through a Freedom of Information Act request uh, or available publicly on the IRS's uh, website, if I'm not mistaken. So that right there is the next step up. It's, it's not just, hey, you're, you're practicing under these conditions. It's you can't practice until you, you tell us you know, why you should be reinstated. And even then, you're going to be subject to some conditions. And the last one is disbarment. Just like a lawyer being disbarred, it is a permanent termination of right to practice. Permanent meaning that there is a, there's no automatic appeal process, there's no uh, practicing with conditions or certain considerations. It's just boom, done, no longer practicing, can't do it, can't represent people, stop your business immediately. Okay? After a five-year period, it can be appealed. They use the word permanent much like they do when they talk about permanent disability in that it, it covers a specific set amount of time longer than a year. In this case, five-year period. After five years, you can, petition, um, you can petition the Department of the Treasury, the Secretary of the Department of the Treasury directly uh, to, to get reinstated. So unless there is a, 
a, a court case that, that disbarred you, like the people who were disbarred for not having proper continuing education credits and then got reinstated when the IRS lost the court case in, in Washington, D.C., you're, uh, you're looking at uh, only appealing directly to that, the, that Treasury Secretary uh, in order to get reinstated. And then last, of course, are the monetary penalties uh, that are possible for filing returns fraudulently or doing things incorrectly uh, that we talked about just a little bit ago. Fees. Part of Circular 230 covers what you can charge your clients. Um, for the most part, people who are using uh, software through us have the fees automatically calculated uh, as a facet of their partnership through a pricing schema that we include with every single return that attempts to meet a certain average point price point uh, for returns based off of data from across the country. Now, this is your guys' business. So you can charge whatever you want. That, that, that pricing sheet that we have is not a strict rule. We don't have minimum pricing requirements or anything. Uh, there are some minimum requirements for the bank, uh, only because the bank uh, across the country has set fees that they charge for their services, and you need to make sure that there are certain you know, amounts of refund and certain fees that are a certain level. Uh, but typically, you have the full ability to go through, charge whatever you want. I've seen people charge $50 returns and just work in volume. I've seen people charge for additional services or wrap it up with a debt consolidation or student loan uh, repayment counseling and, and you know charge a bunch more. But largely, you're going to be subject to uh, avoiding unconscionable and contingent fees. Okay, An unconscionable fee is a fee that is excessive or unreasonable or that is shockingly unfair or unjust. If you are in a low income area and you're the only tax preparer and someone's coming in and you're charging them $800, okay, that right there is an unconscionable fee. And if a, a standard uh, pattern of conduct is revealed and they find out that you're price gouging or that you are being uh, disreputable in your practice and charging these fees, then you can get uh, in trouble as well. So you want to make sure that your fees are considered reasonable Okay, you want to make sure that they represent the amount of work uh, that you are putting into it and the, the national average. And typically, for your average return, uh, itemized or with a Schedule C or EIC calculation, you're looking anywhere from two fifty to three hundred and fifty dollars. With your business returns, six, seven, eight hundred to a thousand dollars or more. You cannot charge contingent fees. Uh, contingent fees are uh, refunds. Uh, like, okay, I want uh, you know this fee if this makes it through the IRS, or I want 10% uh, of your refund. It cannot be based upon a contingency of the return. Okay, you can't charge a fee that is a portion of a refund, or uh, this much is how I'm going to charge you, and then you give me the rest of it if it makes it through. Can't do it. Uh, your fees have to be basically fixed for either a specific or a routine service charged at an hourly rate based off of a range of fees for particular services or forms present or uh, you know initial consultation fees or whatever. Um, it, it is an unfortunate reality of this business that people like to shop around and that you may have people walk into your office, sit down, do the return and decide, nope, I'm going to walk right out. You do have the ability to charge for that initial consultation. Okay, this is a business, they are coming in, they are utilizing a service. I would probably make sure to mention up front if you are going to charge a consultation fee that you do charge a consultation fee so that way uh, they don't waste uh, an hour of your time and prepare a complete return and decide to walk off. That being said as well, just because someone's come in and given you all their information does not give you the right to file it. Until their signature is on that 8879 or on the bottom of the return, you do not have permission to file it. Okay, so if they come in, Charge a reasonable fee based off of your area if you want. You can go ask around. Uh, if you want to get a good basis for how much your local area is charging, walk into a competitor, ask how much you charge for a past year return. Um, while the IRS does accept e-filed past year returns for 2000, and in this case 2000 and uh, you know, 11 and 2012, uh, because this was the 2013 year, uh, you can't use bank products on it, so there's no, well, let's put it in and see what we come up with. Uh, usually, your past year returns are going to have a fixed price. You can take that fixed price and take a look at it and, uh, you know, up it by maybe 25, 50% and see what a current year return is probably going to cost uh, for, for your area, okay? So just remember, no contingency fees, 
no unconscionable fees. Uh, for the most part, you also aren't going to wrap up completely unrelated fees in it as well. So if someone comes in who owes you money, maybe uh, you know, maybe you loaned them out like ten bucks, and they come in, or sorry, ten bucks, a hundred dollars or something, they come in to do their return. You want to try to keep fees that are not related to your financial services business uh, from being on it. Okay, so if it's Additional services that you're providing as part of your total business, including taxes, accountancy, uh, financial counseling, things like that, you can throw them in there, but try not to include things that are not part of it, okay? Those things are covered under Circular 230 as well. There are also a few things that are what not to do that are covering, um, covering specific ethical behavior requirements that you're going to want to avoid. Uh, for one, you want to avoid willfully misleading, defrauding, or threatening clients. Okay, don't lie to a client and tell them something so that way they can do a return, get a pretty looking refund, and you can get more money. Don't do it. It's unethical. The IRS definitely doesn't want it. You don't want to defraud a person. You don't want to tell them one thing and, and then have the return processed with another. You don't want to have them charged one price uh, on the paperwork and then take more out when the return's done. And you don't want to threaten them with some sort of uh, with some sort of demand. It is something that I've learned in the business that there are disreputable businesses who basically say, "Come in and they do the return, and then oh, I got you on contract. You have to come in every single year and file this return." or you're going to be subject to uh, like some sort of fee. Uh, every single year is a new year. There's no contractual obligation to file with anybody. You can't threaten anybody. You can't willfully mislead or defraud them, so don't do it. Incompetent or disreputable behavior. Uh, you don't want to have any conviction of any criminal offense under federal tax laws, or you don't want to hire anybody that has one of those either. You don't want to have a conviction or hire a criminal that involves dishonesty or breach of trust, so check fraud or stealing from the register. These types of things can get your licenses yanked if they're not properly disclosed uh, or you're hiring people and you know they have these things underneath them. can also prevent you from getting a, an EFIN number in order to be able to file returns electronically from your location. Uh, you don't want to have anybody convicted of a felony under federal or state law for which the conduct involved renders that particular practitioner unfit to practice before the Internal Revenue Service. You don't want to intentionally give false or misleading information, either written or oral, to the Department of the Treasury or any of its uh, subsidiaries, affiliates, or any other related department. And you don't want to uh, have somebody that's incompetent and disreputable by failing to file a return or willfully evading assessment or payment of tax. You, know, like so, you don't want to have somebody in there working for you or yourself that just takes the information and just waits too long for it, ends up getting penalties and then writes it off like, oh, well. You know, they want to make sure that you don't do these things. They're all considered unethical, and you can definitely get in trouble uh, from the IRS for, for engaging in these types of practices. You also want to make sure, just like I was talking about with the frivolous position, that you are not willfully assisting, counseling, or encouraging any of your clients to violate any federal tax law or that you are giving them the advice, uh, counseling, or the tactics to evade federal taxes or the payments thereof. And it's not just federal tax, it's pretty much any tax that the IRS is entrusted with collecting. You want to make sure that you are not helping somebody avoid it or violate the law or, well, okay, I'm just not going to, I'm going to pretend you didn't say that and we're going to put this number on there. You want to make sure that you don't do that because uh, you can definitely get in trouble and that's in addition to the client getting in trouble and all those penalties and, and legal ramifications I mentioned earlier you can be subject to uh, by, by assisting somebody in this particular, uh, this particular issue. You want to make sure that you don't misappropriate uh, and make sure that you, uh, you know, misappropriation of or failure to promptly or properly remit funds received for the payments of taxes or other obligations due to the IRS. Um, what this is governing is governing is when a taxpayer comes in and they file. Um, you know, maybe they owe the IRS some money. Now, most people handle this on their own. They take the 1040V or their voucher, they take their payment, their money order, or set up their, their direct deposit amounts, and they pay it that way. Some businesses do offer the ability to do that um, you know, on the client's behalf. Or maybe you're doing bookkeeping, and you're also paying the, uh, the, the withheld taxes on a quarterly basis for a business, because maybe you're a CPA. You know, or you're just doing the accountancy for them, you're filing 941s for their W-2s. If you are not using those funds to go to the IRS for that particular client. Maybe you're skimming off the top, 
or you're not doing it on time, you can get in a, a huge amount of trouble uh, through the IRS, uh, in particular when it comes to employment taxes uh, and misappropriation. That one is one of their big, 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 big focuses, or going after people who uh, willfully misappropriate and, and incorrectly calculate and pay uh, federal taxes in regards to people who are employees uh, that are working under them or that they're doing the accountancy for. Uh, if you attempt to influence any employee of the IRS through threats, false, accusation, or false accusations, uh, duress or coercion, duress in this case means that you're fabricating a personal dilemma or a, a unique circumstance that should give somebody a, a, a pass, uh, you know, or attempting to coerce them through, uh, you know, violence, monetary threats, um, you know, anything. Uh, you want to make sure that you don't do that, that your clients don't engage in it, and that you don't involve in any aspect of that. And uh, what you also want to avoid or getting, doing anything that's going to get you disbarred or suspended as an attorney, CPA, public accountant, actuary, enrolled retirement plan agent, or EA. If you're going to get disbarred or suspended from those practice, can't do returns for the most part, uh, because usually that's going to run counter to having a, a valid P10 that's you know fitting those ethical requirements and and anybody that's subject uh, you know to uh, to circular 230. As well, what not to do? Uh, make sure you don't willfully fail to sign a return. I mean, you can definitely fail to sign a return. You know, maybe you got clients coming in and out of the building all day long. Some of our offices can easily do 20 or 30 returns in a day. Uh, you know, it's possible that they slip, or maybe you have a new employee that just doesn't quite get everything 100%, and you know, lets one walk out the door. That's fine. Willfully failing to sign a return, or in this case as well, ghost preparing by completing the return and then letting the client sign it as though they prepared it themselves, strictly illegal. It's a practice that the IRS has been combating for some time, especially as they're moving towards trying to regulate the tax industry and, and make sure that there's a minimum level of competency and ethics involved. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not willfully uh, failing to sign or you know, ghost preparing a return. As well, there's using tax return tax information in a manner that's not authorized by the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, we have what's called a, a Section 7216 disclosure. You probably see them uh, on the returns if you've prepared returns in the past. They're the, they're the ones that have the PIN number that you've got to go in and you put the dates on. Basically, what those do is they give you the ability to use that information for uh, specific purposes, like sending it to a filing center or sending it to the bank. Uh, and this is really important considering that the recent Obamacare rulings over solicitation for health insurance require a special seven, or Section 7216 disclosure to be signed specifically to give information to health insurance, uh, like marketplaces. Um, taxes and health insurance, they're more intertwined now than they ever have been. However, you do not get your, your tax return and your health insurance on the same form. You, you can get credits for your, your tax returns. Uh, we do have webinars later this year, and we did have them last year, over what to look forward to in the tax sense with uh, the, the patient, uh, you know, provider and affordable care or whatever the PPACA Obamacare um, we, we do have that information available but if you are trying to wrap up health insurance sales into your business you need to make sure that you are aware that there is a separate section 7216 disclosure that's not going to be in your software that you're going to need to have them sign if you're going to get their information over to the marketplace now we do have versions of this uh, form available if I'm not mistaken, it's in both English and Spanish, available in your partner portal through the ERO resources section. So you do have it available at any time that you do need it. Uh, but just keep in mind that if someone's giving you their information in a tax return, that you can only use it in a manner that you've described by one of those disclosures. There are also blank Section 7216 disclosures that we can provide if necessary for you know, aspects of their information that maybe we're not aware of. You know, you know, we don't have a specialized form for it, but you need one, let us know, we'll get one to you. You can also get in trouble for failing to have a valid PTIN when you are preparing a tax return. Uh, preparing a return and instructing client to sign a self-prepared ghost prepares, which I mentioned earlier. Maintaining constructive receipt of uh, disbursement of client refunds. Dis constructive receipts means the ability to spend the money 
or the ability to have access to the money. You don't want to make sure that you can hold on to the ability to spend that taxpayer's money. Don't hold their funds. If they get money from the IRS and they owe you money, that's a civil issue. That's a civil court issue. Make small claims court move on. Don't hold the check. Don't put it in your bank account. Don't sign off on it. Don't hide it. Once the money comes to the, comes to you to give to the client, you have to give it to them if they ask for it. There, there's no ruling, no state, no legal framework that allows you to just take the money and, and, uh, and hold on to it. So don't do it. Uh, people have gotten into a lot of trouble trying to do that in the past. When the money comes to them, that's theirs, plain and simple. And then last as well, retain or withhold client records beyond the scope allowed by applicable state law. Every state is different over what you are allowed to keep and what you are allowed to, or what you are forced to give away. If a taxpayer gives you a document and comes in and asks, typically, even if you're in the middle of preparing a return and you put hours into it, you got to give them the documentation back. Now, there are some states uh, where there are different rules. I don't have a list of them available. You're probably, you'd probably have to talk to a lawyer uh, in your particular state to see you know, what you could hold on to. But the easiest way to avoid that problem entirely is to just make copies of everything that they come in. You're allowed to make copies for your own records. In fact, it's required in some cases for uh, retention requirements through Circular 230. You don't have to give a taxpayer the copies of his own paperwork. If he brings in his W-2s, brings in his tax paperwork, his 1098s, his 1099s, make copies of them, keep them for your own records, and then if they ever come in and ask, you can give them all their originals back, no problem, uh, you know, no trying to withhold on anything. And for the most part, as well, even though it's not specifically covered right here, if a client is playing hardball, maybe their return gets rejected or maybe they get some of their refund seized and you don't get paid for it and you're doing a bank product, don't try to hold on to anything. Don't try to keep anything from them. Give them everything that they need. And if you're really wanting to get that money, small claims court. That's unfortunately the last ditch effort uh, for a lot of these situations. But as long as you've maintained documentation, keep copies of it, have them sign the paperwork when you send it off, and you take that before a judge and say, this guy never paid me, his return didn't get funded because he had back child support, but here, he came into my office, he gave me these documents, I prepared this return, it took me an hour or two hours or however long, uh, that judge is going to rule in your favor, you're going to get your money, okay? So don't try to, don't try to play, uh, you know, judge, jury, and executioner and hold on to stuff, give everything back, give them their money, Take it to court if you absolutely need to. This pretty much uh, gets close to the end of the webinar. We've got a few minutes to kill here for uh, different questions. We do have a variety of resources available. Uh, this particular PDF, this new one, will be updated uh, in the partner portal sometime next week, I'd imagine. Uh, a large portion of us are going to be in Chicago. Uh, for the IRS conference that, uh, that they're having there uh, from the 1st to the 3rd. So if any of you are signed up or going to be in Chicago, it's uh, very likely that you'll be able to come see us there. Now, otherwise, just pay attention. Uh, we will have this material updated and uploaded. Or, since none of these resources have changed since the last time that we made this uh, webinar, uh, you can also go back and pull the archived one from 2013 that has uh, all of these links available. Uh, as well, that you can go ahead and peruse if you need to. Circular 230 is available. Uh, like most publications and uh, bulletins and, and rulings from the IRS, it's a rather boring read. But it is useful to have on hand. It is useful to take some time and, and just to dig through it and, and understand the full scope of, of what's ethical and, and what can happen if you're failing to abide by the ruling uh, that the IRS has out there. As well, we've got you know, enrolled agent portals, uh, EA, or EA enrollment cycle overviews, different overviews of the penalties, Freedom of Information Act overviews, all this other stuff available um, you know, on there. And while I got you on here as well, it's a good time to mention that anybody who is interested in the uh, annual federal tax refresher course that uh, showed a few slides back, the voluntary certification process, uh, we are currently in the process of making the materials and the course materials to allow you to qualify for that uh, annual federal tax refresher certificate. So that way you can you know, proudly display it on your wall and show that you are a, a competent preparer 
you know, that you uh, have been certified with the minimum level of knowledge required to operate, you know, that you're able to, you know, prepare these returns uh, competently over some guy who, you know, has never done taxes before in his life and, and doesn't want to learn anything and is just going off of uh, word of mouth, which is unfortunately a reality. As well, anybody who's interested in doing the enrolled agent testing, we do have enrolled agent test and materials available at a discount. Um, anybody who's interested in doing that, it's a three-part test. They're three hours a piece. It's fairly difficult. It will probably consume at least three to six months of your life and studying uh, in your evenings and things like that. However, it does open up the realm of possibility uh, to expand your business in directions that you never thought before. I know that you know those. Uh, do you have ten thousand dollars in back tax or back tax debt? Uh, commercials. Those are all enrolled agents, and most of those places don't even. Uh, let you give them paperwork until you give them at least a thousand dollars. So it's definitely a benefit to you. There's no collegiate requirements or anything. It just takes diligent study and taking and passing three tests and those CE requirements and you're good. And at this point, it pretty much covers just about anything that you need to know to understand Circular 230 or ethics. Uh, open up the floor for questions, and uh, if you want to, that question panel over on the uh, over on the side, you can go ahead and uh, hop in there and type questions and I'll do my best to answer them you know while uh, while I got you all on here so I'm gonna go ahead and take a second let you guys uh, overview the materials and the questions that you have on hand and uh, go ahead and shoot questions to me and I'll try and answer them in the time that we have remaining Okay, I see uh, an unrelated question here that's just kind of going over practice returns. Uh, any practice returns that we have updated for 2014, uh, the new version of tax software does not become available typically until sometime in uh, late October or early to mid-November. So uh, practice returns for the following year will become available when they are, uh, you know, when the new software actually comes out. There are a lot of changes that take place in the tax code, uh, usually on the realm of thousands of individual entries on an annual basis. So the software uh, is one of the things that comes latest in the tax year. Okay, let's see here. It looks like we've got a couple of questions coming in. Okay, uh, when is the annual federal tax refresher course uh, going to become available? I mentioned before that's going to be for the 2015 filing season, so that's going to be calendar year 2016 that it's really going to be kicking into effect. I'd imagine that uh, CE providers and ourselves included are going to actually have a lot of those materials um, available uh, probably sometime before that time frame to allow us to, you know, get these people and uh, get everybody into the opportunity to go through and, and ask uh, questions and study up and, and have it ready to go. So when they do take the 100 question test, um, that they will be able to pass the test uh, with a 70% pass rate and get that certificate. Okay, when, uh, let's see here, AFTR, uh, the Federal Tax Refresher course outlines, okay, someone's asking about the outlines over the course, uh, outlines, a lot of the stuff for the annual Federal Tax Refresher course are going to be, uh, you know, updated as we go along. The IRS just very recently, as of, uh, as of the 16th, of June here, published their, their draft for how this is actually going to work. Um, they're going to publish a new course outline covering those three domains uh, every May of every single year, and every May they're going to have basically new topics that the course needs to go on. Um, in terms of the credit hours that you're going to need to acquire for maintaining that certification, uh, like I said, it's 18 hours. Originally, people for RTRP were going to have 15 hours, two of ethics, 
three of federal tax law updates and 10 of just general tax law. It's pretty much the same with the only big difference being that instead of three hours of federal tax law updates, it's six hours for the course and the comprehension test in lieu of those federal tax updates. So instead of three hours of federal tax law updates every year, it's going to be federal tax law updates, ethics, and a general tax overview in the form of a course and then a 100 question test, and that will be worth six hours by the time that it's processed. Okay, let's see here. Are there any approved providers uh, that qualify for the... No, as of right now, there are no approved IRS programs that do qualify for the AFTR course. Uh, those are probably being completed. I know we're working on them right now. I know that the other CE providers are probably doing the same thing as we speak. Got teams of people circulating and, and uh, going through creating question banks to get that ready for whenever the IRS starts accepting it. For the, let's see here, are our classes that we are taking now going to count? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. The 18, like, th these are not requirements, quote unquote, for everybody. So for the people out there who are not wanting to go through this voluntary certification process, who don't want that pretty certificate, they just want to prepare returns like they've already, they've already done in the past and that they always will do, there's no CE requirement. Taking CE is entirely voluntary. They can use it to, you know, increase their knowledge or, you know, train their employees. A lot of people use it to train their employees and have them run through since the CE that we do provide covers most of the aspects that are going to be available, uh, you know, during your first year tax preparation. Um, however, any time that you are going to be an EA or you are going to be going for that voluntary certification, these courses definitely are required and definitely do count. The voluntary certification is just a really nice way to distinguish yourself from your competition, okay? Because I'd imagine CE providers are probably gonna start off with having the expensive versions available, you know, the ones that are gonna run a couple hundred dollars, come with a little booklet and, and uh, you know, basically reuse existing RTRP resources and, and wrap them up into this new format. Uh, but then eventually they'll start offering uh, cheaper alternatives and stuff. I'm aware that I believe we are going to be offering AFTR courses uh, through uh, our partnerships here so that people uh, that want to do them and want to take them uh, can possibly get that certification without, you know, breaking the bank over it. But any CE that we have is going to qualify as qualifying continuing education for AFTR uh, courses and for enrolled agents. Uh, let's see here. What is the cost of uh, becoming an uh, enrolled agent? Oh, well, the cost for becoming an enrolled agent, there are a variety of costs. First, there's the cost for the tests. There are three separate tests, one over ethics, one over business, and one over individuals. The ethics is the easiest. The individual happens to be uh, the one that's probably most familiar to everybody, and it's pretty difficult. The business one is a monster. The tests themselves are offered through uh, ProMetric, which is a natural or a national testing chain, and they cost somewhere in the range of hundred dollars per uh, per test registration, and they're uh, three hours long. Um, no materials brought in. You get some scratch pad and, and uh, a pencil and questions on a computer uh, that you got a three hour timer on. It's a fairly comprehensive overview of about everything that you'll deal with on all three aspects of those tax preparation and like I said it's a hundred dollars per test as well the initial application itself to the IRS is going to be thirty five dollars that you have to send in with the application and it takes them a couple of weeks to process that now for the practice materials in order to study for the EA, uh, the cost for those varies widely based upon who you use. Uh, we happen to have a partnership with um, Fast Forward Academy that allows us to get those materials at a discount to partners, uh, typically in the two to two three hundred and fifty dollar range, or even cheaper than that. It really just depends on exactly what level of materials you are looking for. Um, 
However, that does give you access to a physical booklet, access to unlimited questions, uh, practice tests, and as well they have a mobile, mobile features, so if you're like me and you are practically addicted to your smartphone, then you'll be able to you know, sit in any room in your house and, and take tests all day long. Uh, I know that uh, for most of us here, it took about three hours of uh, daily, or three hours, <laughs> three months of multiple hours of daily studying to get competent enough in order to pass. Uh, and we do have those available at a discount. Otherwise, if you're buying them elsewhere, you're going to be looking anywhere from $300 to $600. Let's see here. Are there any handouts that we can get to train our employees? Well, handouts in the sense of the slides from continuing education are always available and always archived through the partner portal. So anytime you log into your partner portal, go over to CE and choose any one of the categories. Underneath uh, the webinar button that says click here to watch webinar is a download button that lets you download a PDF version that you can view on your computer or you can print and hand it to them. In terms of a, an overall overview, uh, on tax preparation itself is something that we just don't uh, generally have, uh, like starting a tax return from start to finish, that's pretty much handled in the training, although if you do have any questions, do not hesitate to contact Federal Direct Support staff. Now let's see here, looking at any of the questions, it does not appear that we have anything that we haven't already answered, uh, give one last opportunity in about four or five minutes, maybe, uh, in order to get a few rounds of questions in before we wrap this thing up. I would like to thank all of you guys uh, for, for you know, sitting through and, and listening to this. I know it's not the most uh, interesting information in the world, but it is definitely something that you want to know and have at the back of your mind as you're preparing returns, because nobody wants to be charged a bunch of money, nobody wants to sit in jail, and nobody wants to get their clients in trouble. So as long as you're participating ethically as long as you are you know making sure that you're operating with the due diligence in mind and that you're keeping an eye towards uh, you know tax cheats and frauds then you should be completely covered uh, let's see here uh, for any sort of training by the way uh, someone did mention this and it is actually a really good point if you if you are looking for a handout for an employee to get someone up to speed kind of over taxes as a whole uh, the IRS has what's called publication 17 Publication 17 is just the sort of general overview for just doing taxes um, or, you know, uh, tax preparation. It covers income and expenses and stuff. It doesn't go quite as in detail as some of the other publications over specific things like the business publication or tax guide for aliens, but Publication 17 will give you just about everything that you need to know, and it is free, available on the IRS's website. Just Google it or Bing it or whatever, Publication 17, the top link should be a link right to the IRS's uh, file. As well, you have Publication 17 available on the icons at the top of all of your software platforms. It's always there, always available that you can use for, for studying. I believe that does wrap up all the questions that uh, we have. If you have any other questions at all, uh, do not hesitate to give us a call uh, during our normal business hours, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard to 6 o'clock Eastern Standard during non-tax season, 866-357-2052 if you need to. As well, we can also be reached at any time through email. Mine in particular is dnorth at federaldirecttax.com. So you know, shoot me an email if you need it. And like I said before, uh, a large portion of the office is going to be at the conference in Chicago from July 1st to 3rd. So if you happen to be near the conference or convention center and you're in town or you're attending it, uh, try to shoot us an email, let us know, and maybe we can meet up and say hi. Otherwise, the rest of you have a fantastic evening, and if you need anything else, don't hesitate to get in touch. Thanks.